Vamos então dar início à nossa sessão. Uh, I want to give a warm welcome to Amalka Laugh and Elizabeth Graham from the Serpentine Galleries. Uh, I'm just going to read a little short information about their uh, biographies. I'm going to do it in Portuguese. If you need the English version, you can find it on, the, on our book. Então, Amalka Laugh é curadora e artista. Atualmente é curadora de projetos na Serpentine Galleries Londres, onde trabalha no Edgeware Road Project desde o seu início em 2009. <coughs> Aqui e em outros contextos, começariam a desenvolver residências, exposições, oficinas e projetos de pesquisa colaborativa que abordam o papel da arte operando em contextos pedagógicos e de urgência social. Elizabeth Graham é curadora e educadora, educadora em Londres e Amsterdã. Atualmente ela é curadora assistente de projetos no Serpentine Galleries, juntando artistas, comunidades, grupos auto-organizados, para estar na segunda página. <risos> e ações sociais através de programas de residência de longa duração. Juntamente com o seu papel na Serpentine, Elizabeth iniciou recentemente o projeto Constellations, um grupo de trabalho na Flat Time House Lounge, que apoia artistas a desenvolver a sua prática explorando o papel da atividade social e política na arte. <risos> Hello. <laughs> um, yeah, so we are going to speak in English and how is it, how does that feel? Is that okay? <coughs> Good. So, hi. Um, thanks so much to Carla and Amanda for this amazing invitation. Um, excited to be here in Portugal. Uh, I'm Amal. Um, I'm Leslie. And um, we wanted to speak today a little bit about our work and the title of our hour and a half that we have together is called Practicing Collective Futures. Um, and uh, I guess today we're going to talk a little bit about what we do. Um, I'll speak a little bit about the Center for Possible Studies, which was a space um, that existed in a neighborhood in London from 2009 to 2013-14. Oh. From 2009 to 2014, but um, yeah, we're going to be talking about lots of other things too. Yeah. Um, so for the session, we'll sort of move between um, telling you a few stories about the projects that we work on, um, some case studies, and then we're going to intersperse talking with some exercises um, to kind of share with you how we approach and actually do the work that we do with people in the city. Um, it'd also be really great uh, to understand who's in the room with us today and have discussions and feedback from you and kind of think together about what questions or issues or context that you're working in right now and what the most urgent issues for you are within your practice um, and life, if you want to share that too. Um, and we're also going to be doing some readings uh, from a book called Emergent Strategies, um, Shaping Change, Shaping Worlds, which is a book um, by a community organizer and facilitator called Adrian Marie Brown, working in the US um, right now, but also internationally, um, <laughs> that is also um, impacting and influencing the work that we're doing right now. Um, so I'll, be I'll begin with a, with a reading from the, from the opening of this book. Uh, so you might want to close your eyes if you want to. <laughs> so take a breath for the day you have had so far and take a breath for this precious moment which cannot be recreated now another for the day and night coming here you are in the cycle between the past and the future choosing to spend your miraculous time in the exploration of how humans especially those seeking to grow liberation and justice can learn from the world around us how to best collaborate how to shape change <laughs> so, um, I guess we want to talk about futures and um, maybe the origins of how we've been working. I mean, it's not like, uh, I know I'm really excited to hear about the different ways that the people in this room are using their art and pedagogical practices to uh, further social justice uh, causes in their own context. 
Um, but really the origin of the work we do um, begins um, uh, in a neighborhood in London called the Edgware Road, um, where we set up the Center for Possible Studies. And I think the word possible is really important for us when we're thinking about the futures. And um, Serpentine, I don't know who's been to the Serpentine Gallery here. Yeah, a few of you, yeah. It's like a super posh, <laughs> glamorous, um, fancy. fancy, it's like next to Princess Diana's old house, you know, like it's in a really like posh neighborhood. And uh, it's too, no one can hear us. Okay, so um, the Serpentine is in a super posh area. And um, in 2009, myself and Jana Graham, we were invited to run a neighborhood project in a neighborhood just north of the gallery, which is very, very different than this posh area. Um, I think they hired me because uh, my background is from the Middle East and I used to work in Cairo and uh, in, a, in a gallery. I, I come from a context where there is no art world somehow. <laughs> it's like always within the community. Like for me, I, I don't make a distinction between these things. Um, so uh, we're invited to go to this neighborhood and we start to research this neighborhood and they said, run some artist residencies and we'll make artworks about the Middle Eastern community in this, this neighborhood. Um, but as we entered the neighborhood, we started to realize many things. This area is right next to a very rich area, but at the top of the street, there is something like 10,000 refugees and asylum seekers coming from Iraq and Kurdistan. And on the other side of the street, we have Tony Blair, Pervez Musharraf, other millionaires and billionaires, you know, living on one side. So there's this area which is um, super diverse, very much like London, where you have some of the richest people and like some of the most disenfranchised people. But this was 10 years ago. This is a moment where London was just about to turn into the nightmare <laughs> that it has become now, where um, they wanted to gentrify anything, everything, everything possible. So we entered the street and we realized from our conversations with the government and local government that they're about to transform um, an area, the largest area of social housing in central London mm -hmm. to private luxury apartments. And as we started to talk to people on the street, nobody really knew. And so we asked it, started to ask this question, and it's a question we can think about in almost any city, in almost any context in the world. Why is it that we are not, we the, or the people that are most affected by the changes that are coming to our cities and our neighborhoods, why are we not part of understand, or developing the plans for it? Why are we not part of producing the studies and the um, plans for what's going to happen? Um, and, and how can we create a context or a space where we can begin to intervene and begin to think about how we participate actively in the future of the spaces we live in. Um, so this weekend, um, before I, I present a bit more, I wanted to share this little video. Um, uh, I was just with um, an artist called uh, Cecile B. Evans. Uh, she's an artist based in London. And she doesn't do uh, kind of social practice work or anything like that at all. Uh, but she made this film recently, which really thinks about what I think is a problem. The idea of a singular vision. And I think all of us are at the mercy of somebody else's <laughs> singular vision. So I'd just like to share with you this clip. Um, it's from a, a series of uh, films called Amos's World, um, which Cecile just recently made in 2017.
how do I do it? I try to think about what I want. I want to build something important. That's not right. I want to change the world. It sounds wrong when I say it out loud. I want to express myself, but I can't find the words. I draw a line from where I'm feeling to what I want, where I want things to be. And that's my plan. I don't know what the plan is. Surely someone has asked you about the plan. So, uh, anybody recognize <laughs> this person? I mean, she based Amos, um, the story basically is of Amos, who is an architect, and she built it. She's very interested in the, the histories of people like Corbusier and, and these kind of visionary people that made these very utopic modernist propositions. I think there is some in this city, right, mm -hmm. of a city within a building, like the perfect utopic society. Um, but it's often authored by one man, <laughs> one man by himself, and, and, and then they stop working. And, and we want to, and there's this big question, this crisis, why, why isn't it working? Um, so I think that's something um, I want to think about, um, because uh, I guess over the last 10 years, we've worked um, on over 40 projects where we bring artists, different cultural workers into conversation with people in neighbor neighborhoods around London, not just in this one neighborhood in London, who are thinking, who are already working around fighting for their housing rights, fighting against um, migrant injustice, um, thinking about policing and increased policing in our cities. And what we do is we bring different artists and cultural workers together with actual campaigners and social movements so that we can think together about how we can create a different imagination of what's possible in the future. And I wanted to just um, uh, bring Adrienne Marie Brown back into the room because she said, she said this amazing quote, which I love saying now, um, that um, we are living in the imagination of those who thought economic disparity, racism, and the destruction of communities would be an acceptable cost for their power. And it's our right to collectively write ourselves back into the future. And so I think that there's a really important role, actually, for cultural workers. Because sometimes people ask me, you know, why, why artists, you know, why are you not just doing the social justice work all the time? And I feel that there's something there that we as artists and educators can bring, maybe tools, maybe ways where we can start to build imaginations collectively with others or provide the tools where this imaginative space is easier reached than people that are constantly in crisis mode fighting. So how do we practice the future collectively? Um, we're always living inside of a social context. The institutions and social norms we're surrounded by are currently and have historically shaped us. We're both in a historical moment and strongly shaped by the flow of history before us. We embody our social context, just as we are shaped by and embody our family context, our community context, and the land that we're from and the environments that we live in. When we look at change and transformation in a social context, um, the social context is the most influential of forces, whether we're focused on personal change, community change, or larger <coughs> systemic government change. The social context in Europe is based on domination, histories of colonization and slavery, and institutions and norms that systematically oppress some groups and the earth and privilege others. Individualism is held as paramount, and interdependence, is, interdependence and collective work is increasingly underrated and undervalued. 
There are a strong ongoing set of contradictions between the national narrative of freedom, democracy, and the social and the ongoing institutions of war, oppression, and corporatization and privatization. We live in this commodified capitalist system where profit is the fundamental measure of success, not happiness and not collective well-being, and not the sustainability of life. All of this touches us, affects us, and strangely shapes us in a way inside our bodies. And that in turn affects the ways that we work together. Any of us here that are doing community practice or organizing for social justice, for collective healing and empowerment, are working to change these social conditions. Really, we're changing both our internal and external worlds simultaneously because the social has shaped us too. Who we are as we organize together and build movements together and how we develop ourselves individually and collectively deeply affects our relations, creativity, and how we assess our conditions and opportunities and what visions and strategies for the future we can imagine. Often those of us moved to do this work have been deeply hurt by oppression or violence ourselves. And this can be a strong calling to do this work. And it's something that I think um, has come up a lot in the work that Lizzie and I have been doing recently, is to really think about embodied knowledge. Um, the thing that we have, our weapons that we have to fight against state, um, like a uh, whole state uh, evidence and, and studies and reasons for these privatizations and shifts in our cities, the only way we can, we can come up with a different logic is to speak from our bodies and our collective bodies too. So um, today we're going to talk a little bit of these strategies. We're going to think about the different um, art forms and methodologies that have truly influenced us. Um, many of them actually come from Brazil. I think that we're both, um, I, I'm like almost shy to talk about Boal <laughs> here in this room because I know that there are Boal practitioners with us here. Um, so I'm really excited to, to do this as well because for the last eight years it's shaped my whole life and how I work with others. Um, but I guess one of the senses, and if we're thinking about the body, one of our main senses that we, we think about is um, our, our ears and our listening sense. And for us, listening is a very important beginning to any project that we do. So um, we thought we'd begin, because um, we're talking a lot, and you guys are in a conference where you're going to be talked at a lot. We thought, let's use our voices. I know you've already warmed up. You've done some singing this morning. So we're going to do more. <laughs> Is that cool? Um, so uh, one of the main uh, influences, uh, one of our other god godparents, apart from Farah and Boal, is uh, Pauline Oliveros, who, is, uh, who wrote, uh, who was a deep listening practitioner and taught uh, many, many people how to listen in different ways. And she wrote many scores that can be, has anybody done this particular score? It's called the tuning meditation. No? Mm -hmm. um, well, it's, uh, we've done some breathing and we've used our voice, but um, it's an exercise where we can start to become a collective body whilst also being individuals in a room. This is something Boal does really well, but so does Pauline. Um, I Google translated this, but I, I think it's incorrect <laughs> Portuguese. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm going to read it out in English. And for those who need the instructions, they're also here. But it's something very simple, and there's no uh, beginning or end. We're going to see how naturally, what naturally we produce in this room. And the instructions are, these are this is her score, that we all close our eyes and inhale deeply. And when we exhale, we exhale on a note, we make a sound, we can say mmm or ah uh, or whatever you want <coughs> when you exhale, you do any sound and listen. You want to simultaneously be exhaling, giving your sound, and as you inhale, you listen to the sounds around you, 
Your next exhale, you try and make a sound that's different than any sound you heard. You do that again, and then you try and do another note of your choosing. Your next breath, you try and make a sound you haven't heard. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I'm going to record it. <laughs> then we can listen back. Yeah, we can try and listen. And um, I've done this before in different rooms, different sizes. And uh, it's always interesting. And I'm not going to... I'm, the only thing we can do is start at the same time, but I'm not going to direct when we end. Let's just see how long we can keep our collective breath going. Yeah? <coughs> <coughs> Breathe in.
how did um, people find that? Mm -hmm. Anyone got any comments, feelings? Did you hate it? Did you like it? Well, we can, uh, we'll, listen it, we'll listen together at the end and hear how we felt as a group <laughs> at the beginning and see how we feel at the end when we hear ourselves. Mm. Maybe we can make a, a record together. <laughs> So, um, as Amal was saying, listening um, is really part, really at the heart of what we do. And we do that in many different ways. And how we kind of really acknowledge that listening is a real, like, critical register of, like, social and political life. And through that kind of process of listening, you can really develop kind of pedagogical spaces of care um, and kind of and reciprocity. And I think that um, definitely within a UK context, I, I don't know so much about the context here, but uh, the kind of welfare system and our education system has really been divorced or kind of uncoupled from this idea of care. And, um, and now it's kind of been really replaced with a kind of competitive and profit-driven model um, that we see at the moment. Um, and I think one particular way that we listen is that we always work in partnership we always spend time with people who um, understand the issues um, and the context that we're working in from a completely different perspective than where we come from. Um, and so that might be kind of partnering with a, a school, but it also might be partnering with a, an organization um, that works within the criminal justice system and the effects of the criminal justice system, or it might be working with an LGBTQI um, asylum seeker and refugee organization, which is like one of the contexts that we're working in at the moment. Um, and I think for me, when I talk about um, pedagogical spaces of care, I'm really talking about um, what the child psychologist W.D. Winnicott talks about when he describes um, transitional spaces. So um, he sort of talks about that from the perspective of a child who um, needs a transitional object. There's an example where you know a child moves, moves schools and they find themselves in a kind of new space and they don't know how to be, they don't know how to relate, they don't know how to behave. Um, and so you can give someone a transitional object that kind of supports them um, to kind of settle or find their grounding in that place. And um, actually there's a really, an essay that I love by Andrea Fraser. I don't know if we've got any Andrea Fraser fans in here, but I love her work. And she wrote, she wrote a um, text called Why Do Fred Sandbach's Artworks Make Me Cry? Um, which is really about a journey that she takes to Dear Beacon in New York and she encounters these works by Fred Sandbach and she talks about this moment that she has inside the institution, inside the work of Fred Sandbach and how um, it creates this place where, um, or this kind of transitional space that I'm talking about, a space um, of possibility, a space where um, you can renegotiate loss within an institution that maybe you find yourself in or you find yourself excluded from or you find yourself subject to and you can um like i said renegotiate and create a kind of space of um i don't know multiple types of spaces like spaces for healing or spaces to rehearse change or spaces to speak back to power from um and i think for me in, in this kind of the work that we do we're always trying to establish this kind of in between space um of, po of kind of possible change and also in that space like how do we work with people um, and really listen to them to sort of uh, make work with people rather than about people um, and I think for me also a key question when we are listening is that how, how do we also create the conditions for people um, to lead a kind of like full emotional life especially because a lot of the people that we work with um, are really denied those types of spaces um, through the kind of systems that they're subject to, whether that's the kind of brutal immigration system that we have at the moment in the UK, which is one of the most sophisticated in Europe. Um, uh, and so, yeah, that is um, really part of what we do. So I'm just going to read um, uh, another extract from Emergent Strategy. Uh, so the Sufi poet um, Hafiz said, how do we listen to others? As if everyone were my teacher. 
speaking to me her cherished last words. I am listening not with all of my senses, um, oh, sorry, not with my all of my senses, sorry. <laughs> As if the world, if the whole world universe might exist just to teach me more about love. I listen to strangers, I listen to random invitations, I listen to criticisms, I listen to my body, I listen to my creativity and to artists who inspire me. I listen to elders, I listen to my dreams and the books I'm reading. I notice that the more I pay attention, the more I see order, clear messages, patterns and invitations in the small and seemingly random things that happen in my life. In all of these ways, I meditate on love. Um, and so, you know, part, part of this listening process, as Amal said, is that we work with artists um, to think about the different types of strategies that their practice can also bring into that room and into contact with others and be shaped and influenced by the people that we work with and the issues that are affecting them. Um, so, may I hand over to talk about one of the projects? Yeah. yeah. Oh, I didn't talk about these questions. Sorry, everyone. No. I'm uh, getting confused about the uh, order of the slideshow. But, um, <laughs> so these are like three questions that we really think about when we're um, thinking about how, how we do the work that we do. So how can we stand in solidarity with those that we work with? Mm -hmm. um, especially because we work with people who have had completely different life experiences to us necessarily. And we also bring a whole different set of life experiences into that room too. Um, especially like Omar was talking about, like where you also hold all of those experiences, not just in um, language, but also in your body and how that affects how you can be present in a room and what are the group dynamics um, due to those experiences and um, the power dynamics that, that also is implicated in that. Um, how are artists also actively engaging in these challenging systems? So that's also really important that we always work with artists that um, want to do this work. <laughs> You know, and they don't want to just do the kind of um, uh, representation or they just want to perform the politics. Um, and how, um, which artists practice align and seek to contemporary struggles, that's just what I was talking about. Um, yeah, but we will, we will introduce you to a few of those artists um, now. So, um, this is an image uh, from this ongoing uh, project that began long ago, it actually began in 2011. So another thing that I'd like to say about the kinds of work we do, um, which is um, somehow despite the institution we work with, um, but we're allowed to very much so we have a lot of autonomy, is we work with people for a very long time. So, um, so, um, <laughs> So Implicated Theatre is a project that's been ongoing since 2011, and, and this is the project that I was saying is um, a Vawal project. So I just want to see who are Vawal people in the room. Um, who are the Teatro do Primido people? <laughs> <laughs> hey! Hello! <laughs> Hi! Um, so I was... Uh, I. Uh, I don't, I don't have a theater background. I, I actually come from like a documentary film background. <laughs> uh, that's how I started working in, uh, uh, in the arts. Hi. Um, so uh, Implicated Theater uh, began in 2011. And so this is still when we were, we weren't just doing projects all over the city. We were um, based on this road. And uh, we didn't really have an office all the time. The Center for Possible Studies sounds like a museum by itself, but actually it was just like people congregating around different cafes <laughs> on a really, really migrant, in a really migrant neighborhood in London, as well as we had a, a, a few centers like over the years we had, uh, we occupied spaces a little bit. But um, in one of the cafes we were working in, um, we had lots of artists coming in, doing research, listening, mapping to the street, thinking about what is the most important thing that they want to work with, who do they want to partner with, who should we establish relationships with. And um, suddenly, the cafe that we were hanging out in every day, uh, we turn up there one day and it's closed. 
uh, we contact the cafe owner because we were dependent on their Wi-Fi <laughs> and their free tea. And uh, they, they said, oh, we, we were raided yesterday. The, um, basically, uh, UKBA, uh, the, the kind of unofficial police of the border um, of the UK came and raided um, the premises and arrested lots of people who were eventually going to be deported. So a lot of our friends that we'd known for ages and la la, they were just disappeared. <coughs> so the artists we were with, they were like filmmakers and they're like, we have to make a film about this, we need to do la la la. And um, we decided let's make a film or let's make a script together um, with the waiters and the people that were really affected by the raids. Let's not just make a film about what happened like a documentary. So um, we we said, how do we do this? And at the same time this was happening, there was a lot of protests in the UK because this was the time where the conservative government just came in uh, and they started the process that we're now in <laughs> today, where 10 years later, um, you know, they made cuts, 50% cuts to education. Like so many protests, there was student protests, there was like <coughs> immigration protests, there was protests about cultural funding, protests about everything, um, protests about the Olympics, you know, like there was so much going on. And we met this woman called Frances Rifkin who studied with Augusta Boal. And she was, uh, she is in her 60s, an amazing energetic person who actually used Boal in the 80s uh, as part of the protests that happened in the UK during the strikes, during the minor strikes, the steel worker strikes, when Margaret Thatcher first started to privatize the country. So we met this incredible woman who was actually funded by the state because back in the 80s, the British government used to fund political art. <laughs> um, she was funded for years to just live with uh, the striking people and she did theater, uh, with people to organize and we said wow we want to meet this person and let's start a process with her so we started to have uh, weekly um, workshops at the center and in this uh, cafe with the workers and then uh, workers that were affected and we started to invite other migrant justice organizations and and we had lots of artists that were interested to learn and we said okay we'll do a 12-week workshop to learn theater of the oppressed and we're going to make a statement about what happened in the raids. This project lasted, we continued meeting for one year. <laughs> we didn't stop. We were just like, actually, this is so transformative, this form of theater. It's transformative because there were people that did not, not speak English, that were still telling stories. There were people that were speaking English, that were suddenly learning all of these things from, from work that we were doing with our bodies. Um, and uh, Implicated Theatre was born, and we've been working together now ever since. So we're now in our eighth year. Um, and um, I wanted to talk about this project because, um, uh, for many reasons, uh, but mainly because um, it's such an amazing tool. And I, I, if anybody hasn't used the well exercises, we have some instructions in how in English, but I feel like here in this country, you've got access to incredible actual resources of direct Bawal practitioners here. Um, and we used it in many ways. So the group stopped being about artists working with people. It became about the group itself. So this group, of, of migrants so that everybody in the group um, is a migrant or has been affected by the migration or by the home office like myself I've gone through so many things with with the home office which is the Ministry of Interior like it's a very scary institution and so we do a lot of projects where implicated theater now works with other uh, migrant justice organizations. So we've worked with many migrant labor unions, for example. We've worked with um, anti-raids groups. So we work with activists that are trying to educate people on their rights. So for example, for one year, we did a, uh, a series of plays where we would educate people that in the UK, you don't have to show your ID. 
So there's this really nice law in the UK where you don't know, you do not have to show your ID. So if the police come to raid you or they come and stop you, which they do, they go to bus stops, they go to Colombian nightclubs, uh, um, they go to uh, wherever and they're like, show me your ID. Yeah, they go to meetings, they go to political meetings and they're just suddenly like, show me your ID. But actually you don't have to show your ID. You can say no. It's a legal right. Yeah. And so um, we started to do a lot of plays. So, th so this group ended up doing workshops, <coughs> Theatre of the Oppressed workshops, to tell the story with others. Um, we worked with migrant labor unions. So we've worked a lot with an organization called Justice for Domestic Workers. So they're a group of domestic workers who are trying to get better visa rights for domestic workers. We work with um, hotel worker unions. Uh, which are made up for three years, we worked with them. So they're kind of talking about how most of the, the low paid workers in, in the UK are not actually nationals of the UK. In fact, they're European and non-European nationals um, that are doing the work. <laughs> and, and we wanted to tell the story and, and use theater in different ways. So we're really stretching the format of, of Bawal. We're not always doing a form, forum theater performance um, in the very traditional Bawal sense. In fact, we also are a bit critical of Bawal in the sense that it's very binary, it's very good and evil, and we don't we don't think it's much more complicated. Everybody is good and evil, actually. Uh, and uh, and so we, we've done this process with many things. We've done training videos. Uh, so we've done a lot of training videos for union organizers because a, a lot of union organizers are white British old men. And, and we're like, how do you organize uh, women that are not English speaking and so on. So we've done training videos to kind of like support people through those processes and I'd love to share some of those projects with you guys. Um, but one of the things that we did want to share is this three-year project which was uh, with uh, e ESL teachers. So they're English teachers. So for us we realized that there's an urgency around the migration crisis in the UK. Uh, people are getting deported left, right and center. So Theresa May, who was the former prime minister, before she was a prime minister, she actually deported more people from the country than anyone in the history of anyone, because she was the head of the Ministry of Interior or the Home Office. And, um, and so we realized that the uh, English teachers, they were at the front line of contact with migrants because in order to get any status you need to learn English and so we started to meet a lot of politicized English teachers who wanted tools to bring into their classroom so implicated theater as a group we started to work for a year with um, English teachers to teach them oh well and then together in another year we worked with 13 teachers to start to think about how to bring it into a language classroom. How do you bring Bawal into a classroom? So, okay, we don't have a big community center. We don't have an open hall, but we can still think about Bawal. We can still do grammatic grammar lessons and learn Bawal, you know? And so we developed a curriculum uh, which is free and available. Uh, and maybe it doesn't make sense here, but we bought some copies for people because it was somehow a toolkit that we collaboratively produced with 13 teachers and Im the Implicated Theatre Group and a, an incredible comic book artist. Yeah, we should go through it. So these are some of the teachers we were working with. Um, and we worked with this incredible illustrator um, who basically followed the journey of the 13 teachers. So each of the teachers brought into their classroom experiments um, for them, it was quite difficult. It's, it's difficult in a classroom to do the simple thing, which is changing the space, which is something Bawal always starts every process with. Let's remove all the tables and chairs. P students like to hide behind a chair and table, some people. And also, a, a lot of them were working with people that are not very comfortable using their body. You know, there there's like one teacher, she was working with a group of 
um, South Asian women who had already been in Britain for 30 years and didn't speak English at all, who often were just in their community and found it difficult to touch. You know, touch was difficult for them. So, so we were thinking of lots of different ways and we worked through lots of different methodologies. But our, our idea with this is like, how do we give some of these teachers who, who are actually doing the work uh, the tools so that they can also do it. And now these teachers are teaching other teachers using this curriculum that we created. So I just wanted to share this, this particular story because um, it kind of is a, a illustration of how we like to do our projects in a way. Think about an art form, think about a methodology. What does it offer? people doing social change and then giving the social social changers the tools to maybe turn it into something else uh, that might not look great for a museum but for us that's not the point of what we're doing and so we were going to do a bowel exercise outside how do you guys feel about going outside yeah yeah it's hot it's hot yeah yeah shall we just go outside and do something together yeah. um, welcome back um, thank you Thank you very much. Um, it was really nice to hear um, some of the things that people care about. Family came up a lot, so I always like talking about family. Um, so I'm just going to do another reading from Emerging Strategy. One of my favourite questions today is, how do we turn a collective full-bodied intelligence towards collaboration, if that is the way we will survive? My favourite life forms right now are dandelions and mushrooms. The resilience in these structures which we think of as weeds and fungi. The incomprehensible scale, the clarity of identity, excites me. I love to see the way mushrooms can take substances we think of as toxic and process them as food, or that dandelions spread not only themselves, but their community structure, manifesting their essential qualities, which include healing and detoxifying the human body to proliferate and thrive in a new environment. The resilience of these life forms is that they evolve while maintaining core practices that ensure survival. A mushroom is a toxic transformer. A dandelion is a community of healers waiting to spread. What are we as humans? What is our function in the universe? Um, so <laughs> this is a, uh, one of our current projects that we just wanted to um, talk about briefly with you, um, which is where we're working with an artist called Rahana Zaman, um, with a group of women that have had some kind of um, experience of the criminal justice system in some way through incarceration. So that might be through prison or um, detention. Um, and so we started working with this group of women um, through an organization called Hibiscus um, that support uh, women in various different ways, um, whether that's through kind of legal advice or uh, through therapeutic services um, at a women's centre uh, in oh, Holloway, <laughs> which is basically situated across where um, Holloway Prison used to be, which is a very well-known women's prison in the UK that has actually um, now been shut down and was recently occupied. Um, by a group of activists called Sisters Uncut to kind of reclaim that space as a space for women and non-binary people. Yeah, and I, I think like all of this comes in a context where um, there are lots of facts about uh, women in prison. I think 90% of women that do go to prison in the UK have experience of gender-based violence against them anyway so we we really like um, are thinking with this women about what does it mean to create spaces of care um, in 2011 when I was explaining to you all of the cuts the government did one of the cuts was the cuts to women's shelters so now there are very few women's shelters and domestic violence has uh, against women has gone up by something like six, 70 percent there was like a every day there are five five women I can't remember yeah but also, I think um, also that uh, 
basically as as these centres being closed and also kind of resources to any kind of um, support that women might receive um, due to these experiences is being slowly um, diminished. And that was also true to me. Yeah. And so uh, Rahana Zaman in her practice really thinks about, and that's her there, just sitting down. Uh, she's really interested in different ways that the state enters our body in different ways, whether it's by rules that you start enacting that maybe you don't believe in, or, uh, you know, how bureaucracy kind of affects us in a really fundamental way. And they just, it's, it's given to us as if these are our everyday things. So she started this project out two years ago, and I think it's quite an interesting project in the sense that um, the artist really wanted to, she's a filmmaker, and she somehow was like, um, we started the project out as a movie club. So we were watching a lot of movies uh, and videos and films of how women that have are, are depicted in prisons, like something like Orange is the New Black, or <laughs> Japanese slasher films from the 70s, or hardcore documentaries, Angela Davis talking about the end of prison. And the women were just like, this is boring. <laughs> we want to watch cool movies. And they were suggesting all kinds of really interesting films. And, and it started off as an exchange of us basically watching movies together and thinking about the image of uh, like a woman incarcerated, like from the glamorized image to the more hardcore, you know, documentary stuff. I think deep down, the artist wanted to make a hardcore documentary that was co authored with women. Um, and the images that you're seeing now are actually the results of two years of spending time together. Um, and really, it was a lot of just spending time together with them and their children. Um, we did lots of things like going on trips. We did the wild workshops with them. Um, we eat a lot. I think eating together is probably <laughs> <laughs> the number. Who does community practice here, right? <laughs> eating yeah. is the most important. Yeah. 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 So like in 2009, I started out and I used to give, uh, I used to bring chips and hummus to the workshop. Now, now since Lizzie's with her, we have rice and chicken and <laughs> because I think that is part of this work. I think eating together and being together when we're eating is is so important to what we do. And so this film has become somehow about pleasure and caring for each other. And the film is is co-written. It's it's difficult to uh, work with the uh, you know we really wanted this to be co-authored. We don't want it to be the artist's vision of what the film should be. So this is a day we were in a green screen room, having the best time, getting dressed up. We had makeup artists, you know, it was amazing. And uh, I guess I just wanted to share this and, and Lizzie was gonna share um, a story from Norma, who's one of the participants who's been coming to our workshops for the last two years. Um, so at the moment we we're in sorry, the um, kind of collective editing process so we had a session a couple of weeks ago where we were kind of going through the footage together um, and really thinking about what the film is doing now, now that we've seen the images, um, what is it saying, who should it be said to, who should it be shared with and so Norma who is um, from South Africa, um, she started to speak and I was just typing as she was um, writing and she said um, about the film, um, it's a way of meditation. Feel yourself in the middle of the sea, in the boat, trying everything. You can be everywhere, but you're also trying to reach the land, trying to be free. You struggle to reach the land. This film is like a stepping stone to get somewhere, do something, to move, to step up, to find myself in a group, to be given a chance to talk. The group is propelling me towards freedom make my business, make my camera, do something with myself. This film is about how to be somewhere one day. This is not the end. We are in a situation, but this is not the end. It is a stepping stone or scaffold to the place where you want to be free. I'm always looking at what's behind. I'm always scared that they are coming for me today. In the film, we show the different parts, but also the light, the light and the shadow. 
sorry. <laughs> yeah, she's a real she's a real poet, and um, I think also that's something um, that's been really um, inspiring about this project: the resilience of the people in that room, um, and how they. Well, I mean, for me, like someone asked me what I cared about earlier, and I said love, <laughs> and I'm happy to like name it as that. And um, yeah, maybe I'll do this um, short reading from. Um, okay, yeah, maybe we'll um, actually close with an exercise that um, I also, I'm, I'm on, I lead multiple lives, and um, I also like work with a collective in Amsterdam called um, How to Show Up, where we think a lot about writing, and like writing as a way of um, producing certain social arrangements, and so um, this is an exercise that's been developed together with them that I thought I would that we could end with because um, it's about collective wishing or like producing prophecy or writing prophecy together um, so I'll read the introduction to you um, so when I think about community practice I'm just going to move this I feel like I've got this like weird side side thing um, oh yeah uh, when I think about community practice I think about showing up and the questions of how to how to show up in particular, how do we show up in the right relationship with ourselves and others? How can community practice become a space to intentionally shape the futures that we long for? When I think about showing up and how, I immediately think and create expectations. Expectations for myself, but also expectations for others, for places and for situations too. Everywhere we go, every, everything we do creates expectation. What are they and how do we talk about them? And most importantly, where do they come from? To think about where the expectations come from and what, they're really, what they really are, I believe is to think about the future, to think about promises and how they point us somewhere. This is the point, this point is the where from which we expect or hope for so much. Since the early 20th century, time can be understood not only as a quantity but a quality. Time is not only tomorrow or in 20 minutes, but it's also an experience, a feeling. In other terms, most of us by now use or are aware of the expression quality time. I want to spend quality time. This weekend I'm planning some quality time. We relate time to experience, relationships, duration, goals and desires. The work, the act or the practice of prophecy is, in our opinion, a device and an instrument which to act upon time and place, the future and the where and regain access to it. Through prophecy and within certain specific limits, the words we say, the words we write, the work we make, the people and the things we love and take care of, create a space for things to come true. On the one hand, writing or voicing prophecy can be an exercise or forecasting the future, playing with clairvoyance or playing the role of the oracle. On the other hand, it can also be the work of looking back, uncovering and finding your own truth in the past. What dreams, expectations, desires from the past still point you somewhere and give you confidence and guidance? In very practical terms, this exercise we're about to do will compromise of eating a cookie. I think, um, which translates these cookies we have as cat's tongue in English. Linguas <laughs> di um, So I hope, I don't know if they taste good, I've never tried them, but we're going to yeah, eat a cookie and, and do some writing. And so this exercise will help us locate um, the place from which we expect so much and how to make it make it happen or simply make it up right here right now so we're just going to hand out the cookies and some paper and then I'll read the instructions you can take, you can take more than one if you're really yeah, hungry <laughs> it's nice to have dessert before lunch Shall I some paper? Oh, oh no, I thought this might happen. So you can have to really imagine this is right. If you don't eat the cookies, it's also right. Yeah, you can do it without. Can I pause for the same one? Thank you. 
So um, usually when I do this exercise with the group that I work with, and it's actually an exercise that um, an artist called Jamma, Jamma Ria and Dehta, um, does a lot because he's really interested in magic. Usually it's a cookie that's wrapped in a particular kind of paper. That, oh, slow so I swear, my mum tells me this all the time. It's true, I'm sorry. I speak usually very quietly and very fast. Um, so what I was saying was, um, this exercise um, is developed by an artist called Jean-Marie Yandetta, who's part of the collective that I work with. And it's usually with a cookie that has a particular type of paper, and he's really interested in magic. And so when you burn the paper, which we'll do in a minute, it floats, but we couldn't find them here. So you have to forgive us. Um, so I'm gonna read the instructions. So eat the cookie. Try and keep it in your mouth. Yeah, eat the cookie. Yeah. Try and keep it in your mouth until it dissolves. Mm. <laughs> um, if you don't want to eat the cookie, think about another kind of dessert that's slowly dissolving in your mouth. Think about what the cookie is made of. Thinking, think about the butter and the eggs and the flour, holding them together. Once the cookie is gone, is your, is your mouth empty? Is your, full, is your stomach full? Is there a texture of sugar on your teeth? Something more abstract, maybe. Think about all the other cookies dissolving in the mouths of the people that surround you. What does a dissolved cookie sound like, or look like, or feel like in the future? So on the piece of paper that you have, write a question, or maybe it's a poem, or maybe it's a sentence, or even just a few words about the most urgent question for you in your life and your work right now. What do you wish for? What do you hope for? What would your transitional or in-between space look like, feel like? So once we've written down those desires or hopes or dreams or wishes, we're gonna go outside together. So, I'll give you five minutes, five, ten minutes to write down whatever you want to write down. 